Good to see you, sir. Thank you so much. Well, there's. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Eric Legrand is, in my opinion, the most famous alum of Avenel Middle School. He is someone uh, that just means so much to our school community. He means so much to our town. And he's someone who is just very, very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, my experience with Eric over the years. But first, I wanna just acknowledge some of our dignitaries, which some of these will be a surprise for Eric. He did not know was going to be here to celebrate. And they are here because not only is Eric doing his presentation for our students, there's also a few surprises we have in store. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge our, our dignitaries who uh, took the time to be here today to celebrate with Eric and our school community. We have with us our superintendent of schools, Dr. Joseph Massimino. Round of applause, every, every name I mentioned. We have with us representing our Woodbridge Town Council, Mr. Greg Ficarra. We have with us one of Eric's old friends, teammates at Rutgers University. He also just happened to have been the defensive player of the year in the Big East and played in the National Football League, Mr. Kasim Green. And not only is he a special guest, he is a parent as well at Avenue Middle School. Uh, our next guest is one of uh, Eric's oldest and dearest friends. He was uh, his teammate at Colonia High School. Uh, and he is currently the head coach of the powerhouse Woodbridge High School football team, Mr. Joseph Lasala. We also have with us uh, another one of Eric's oldest and dearest friends, classmate here at Avenel Middle School. Uh, he is a uh, former head coach of Colonia High School uh, boys basketball program. He is a very, very successful coach at the college level. Uh, and is that, can I release that news, the new job, or is that still a secret? Yeah, totally. All right, good, just wanna make sure. I didn't wanna let any cats out of the bed. He is newly appointed uh, staff at Marist College, uh, which is part of the MAC conference. They also have a team where he played point guard a few years back that went to the Elite Eight this year, St. Peter's. We have with us Mr. Brandon Hall. Our next dignitary with us, representing our uh, town council as well. He's our, our local fire official. He is just an absolute uh, friend to Avenue Middle School always supports us in everything we do here. We have with us Mr. Corey Spiller. We also have with us representing our Board of Education here in Woodbridge Township and made time out of her schedule to be with us to celebrate Ms. Sue Bourdain. Representing not only the town council, also for Middlesex County, our executive county superintendent of schools, Mr. Kyle Anderson. And I will say without any hesitation, in all my years in public education, the greatest parent that I have ever dealt with and someone that I have so much respect and admiration for, Eric's mother, Mrs. Karen Legrand. I also have to acknowledge uh, one of our staff members here who uh, headed up our fundraising efforts uh, for a fundraiser here for Eric's foundation this year, 
uh, former coach and just the tremendous supporters of Eric, Mr. Caesar San Diego. So I, I'm just going to give a, a, a little bit of a little bit of background on Eric. Um, I first saw the name Eric Legrand. It was over the summer. I was getting ready to teach my eighth grade classes, and I was reading a, a, a local article uh, about a local uh, travel baseball team that was having all this success, and they talked about a hard-throwing right-hander by the name of Eric Legrand, and this was when he was going into eighth grade. So I looked at my rosters, and sure enough, there was Eric. And my first knowledge of Eric was as a baseball player. So I had Eric in class right here, room 414. I taught him the whole year, along with Mrs. Noth. Mrs. Noth always said, I love Eric. To make sure you tell Eric I love him. I'll, I'll tell him. I, we know. Everybody loves Eric. Well, I'll pass it along. But what I can tell you about Eric is he's been the same person from the minute I met him. He is a hardworking, respectful, young man who always sets a positive example. Worked hard in everything he did, great, great personality, great sense of humor, and it was just an absolute pleasure to have Eric in class. And also, he was involved in our intramural programs with sports right here at Avenel Middle School, and early on, I saw just what a talented athlete he was. So, Eric moved on to Colonia High School. Uh, that following year, when he was a freshman, I was fortunate enough to be promoted to become the vice principal of Colonia High School. So I basically followed him up to Colonia High School and once again reunited. I was with him for four years, but once again, early on as a freshman, you saw just how talented this young man was. And uh, really in everything he did. And throughout his four years at Colonia High School, he became, simply put, the best athlete in the school. And what I can tell you in high schools, the best athlete in a high school, everyone looks to that person for leadership. Everyone looks up to that person. And what I can tell you is over the four years at Colonia High School, he set such a good example and, and made my, my job easy because he set the tone in the building. This is the most talented person in our building. How does he handle himself? In the four years I had him, I don't think I had one issue with him. And he always set that example in terms of his work ethic and how he carried himself. He was so talented. Uh, if you know me, I'm a big Notre Dame football fan. Mr. Spiller will know that. The head coach of Notre Dame came to Colonia High School. He had his big Super Bowl ring. He won, he won a Super Bowl back with Tom Brady, a guy named Charlie Weiss. Notre Dame wanted Eric desperately. But Eric stayed home to play for one of the best coaches in the country, Greg Schiano. All right, and Eric, part of that decision with, with his mother was to make sure he was close to home and she would be able to go to a lot of the games. And what I can tell you is, with Eric, he has never changed in terms of being the person that he is and the role model he is. Through all the adversity, which you're gonna hear about, he has always been a constant role model and people for look, to look up to in terms of how he carries himself, his positivity, and all these things. And over the years here at Avenel Middle School, we have talked, you know, we need something as the inspiration he provides to all of us, every one of us. We were talking about, we need something a little more permanent here as a tribute to Eric, just to let him know how much he means to us. So I'm gonna ask at this time, Mr. Brandon Hall, Mr. Joseph LaSalle, if you can make your way up uh, to the top row there. At this time, is we're gonna get a, a little countdown going from 10 down to one, and we have something that's gonna be a permanent part of this gymnasium to show our love and support uh, for Mr. Eric Legrand. So uh, we're, we're, we're gonna let everyone kinda get in position here for, for some photos, and we're all gonna count together. All right, here we go. 10, nine, eight, seven, Six, five, four, three, two, one. And this is something that's just a small token for our school community to show how much you mean to each and every one of us here 
at Avenel Middle School. All right. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Karen Legrand up here to, uh, with us. Come on up. Come on up. So this year, uh, I want to congratulate Eric on his new business venture. If you haven't, our whole staff this morning had LeGrand Coffee from LeGrand Coffee House, right over there in Woodbridge. If you haven't had it yet, it is the best coffee I have ever tasted. I want to congratulate you on that wonderful accomplishment and continuing to set such a positive example. Now, this year, our school, uh, as part of you know giving back for all you've done for us and. This man is one of the most sought after speakers there is. He always makes time every year to come back and not forget where he came from, all right? He is one of the most sought after speakers. He always makes time for us. So in addition, we also uh, put together some fundraising efforts this year. Uh, I have to acknowledge Mr. Samaniego most recently with some of the events we ran. Uh, but we've been trying to fundraise throughout the year, and I also have, I'd like to present uh, to your mother, Mrs. Karen Legrand. We have a check here in the amount of $1,752 made out to Team Legrand Care of Reef Foundation, and I'd like to present this to Karen at this time. God bless you. God bless you. The work he continues to do to raise money for this amazing cause, uh, we will support every single step of the way. We will, we, will stand, we will stand beside him and we will work to support all of his uh, fundraising and business ventures. All right? Without any further ado, I know we're tired of hearing me. We want to hear from the man that we're all here to hear from, and he's going to begin uh, his student presentation, Mr. Capitello, if we want to get him set up. And I want to just thank all of you. And at this time, we're going to turn it over to Eric, who's going to do his presentation for our students. Well, first of wow, it's been three years since I've been back and full of surprises now this year. Got everyone in the building, Kaz, J. Lies B. Hall, and all the dignitaries from Woodbridge Township. It's pretty cool, I'm not going to lie. You guys got me, and then the batter hanging up. That's awesome. That is cool. And the, well, first of all, I want to thank you guys and all the efforts that it went into. You want to take that? Yeah, I got to take Just give me the feedback. All the efforts that you guys put into fundraising this year, I always say every dollar counts. You know, there's no small amount. Every dollar truly counts going into spinal cord injury research and also just the awareness to be able to think about it and, and see what people go through on a daily basis with a spinal cord injury. To be able to research it and learn more and more about it each and every day. First off, thank you for having me. It's always great to come back home. As Mr. Shore me mentioned, this is, this is where I'm from. I will always come back and support this community because this community has raised me into the person that I am today and how I continue to go out there and try to live my life to the best of my ability to represent this community. I take a lot of pride from being from FNL and everything that has taught me and grew me into the man that I am. A lot of people always think though that my story started on October 16, 2010 when I had my injury, but they always said there was an Eric LeGrand for 20 years before that, before my injury. And just a few stories that I want to take you back to until I really dive into my injury. But first story I always love to tell people is with my story about commitment. When I was 10 years old, I had the same routine every day. I would get home from uh, Avenel Street School 4 and 5, go home, do my homework real quick, run to the park, and play whatever sport it was for the year. At this time, it was in the fall, so we would always get together in the park and play football. I remember one day I was feeling myself. I was like, you know what? I'm the best player on the team. I was playing for the Port Reading Saints at the time. I said, I don't have to show up for practice. I'll just show up for the game on Saturday. So I went and did my regular routine. My mom came to the park after work to get me. She said, Eric, it's time to go to practice. I was like, Mom, I'm not going to practice today. I'll show up Saturday for the game. She said that didn't go over too well for me. She came into the park and dragged me out of there, embarrassed me in front of all my friends, threw me in the car and said, I don't know who you think you are. Just because you're the best player on the team, you think you don't have to show up to practice? You think you're just going to show up for the game? 
I don't care how good the team is doing or how bad the team is doing. When you commit to something, you see it through. Here I am 20 plus years later, and I still remember that lesson of commitment, guys. When you commit to something, you see it through because that's when you truly learn about yourself. That's how you grow. Through the good times, you learn how to handle success, and the bad times, you learn how to handle that adversity. When I got to high school, we had a tradition at Colonia where the sophomore year, the, senior, the seniors would pick a water boy of the team. I got offered a full scholarship as a freshman to go to Rutgers University, but through the tradition, the seniors going into my sophomore year picked me to be the water boy of the team. And I always joke about this because nowadays it's easy. You fill up some water bottles, throw it in the Gatorade uh, container, bring it outside. This was old school where I had to climb down into the sewer hole with the hose, hook it up to the spigot in that nasty hole, come back up, hook it up. Hook the hose up to one of those caution signs, put it on the PVC pipes, and then screw it on. And then after practice was over, had to wait in the hole while everyone was getting water, drinking, laughing around, and then I have to lock it up. But you know what that taught me? Humility and responsibility. Just because I was the best player on that team didn't mean that I still didn't have my responsibilities I had to take care of. I was big to do it. Did I like it? No. Was it fun? No. But it was something I had to do because it was for the team. When I got to college, I thought I was getting recruited to play one position. Ended up playing five different positions that year, and I thought I lost the love of the game of football. I was confused. I was only 18, 17, 18 years old. Didn't know what the coach was doing with my career. But I had a meeting with him at the end of the year, Coach Shiano, and I said, Coach, like, what's going on? Like, you put me in all these different positions when I thought I was here to play one certain position. And he said, do you think I would have put you in a position if I didn't trust you to get the job done? We had to put you in there because we needed you at those roles, and I trusted you at each one of the positions to learn. And you think I would have threw any freshman out there to do that. I put you out there because I trusted in you, and you're going to learn that love is sacrifice. You're going to have to sacrifice for the greater good of the team for something that you truly love. And here I am still. I remember that lesson. Love is sacrifice. The things that we love to do, things that we, that we want to do or make happen that right aren't in front of our face, we're going to have to sacrifice for them. After sometimes you don't get to spend as much time with your family and friends. Sometimes you gotta put things aside because you have a responsibility to take care of. That's what I learned. October 16, 2010 comes and we had we were playing at MetLife Stadium where the Giants and the Jets play. It had just opened up, so we were all excited to play in the NFL Stadium right here in New Jersey. And we tied the game up 17 to 17 in the fourth quarter of the game. First the Army Black Knights was going back and forth, and I had run down a kickoff hundred thousands of times probably throughout practice and just games and whatnot. But that particular kickoff, I remember I was facing the double team, which means two guys came to block me right away as soon as we kicked the ball off. But I was able to go right through my split the double team and I was able to have a 30, 30 yard head start on Malcolm Brown, the guy I made the tackle on. But if you guys ever seen the video before my injury, my teammate actually got down there about a half a second before I did and he tripped him up. And I said, you know, I'm gonna hit the, I was gonna say, I'm gonna use my shoulder on this play. Because I knew it was going to be a big collision. I'm like, I don't want my head to be in it at all. I was going to put my head down so it goes on the side of his body. But when his body, when Malcolm's body twirled in the air, it changed the trajectory of my head. So when I put my head down, thinking it wasn't going to be an attack at all, it actually, the crown of my head went right into the back of his shoulder blade. And next thing you know, the last thing I felt was my body go stiff and my heels hit the ground. From there, the trainers come out, Eric, is it your head or your neck? And I said, I can't breathe. From there, they, can you feel this? Can you feel that? And I said, I can't breathe. Just like that. My head coach comes out and looks at me and goes, E, you have to pray right now. And honestly, when he said that to me, I thought my life was over because I can't move, I can't breathe, and my coach is telling me to pray. I'm thinking, this is it. And at one point, I remember I closed my eyes and I just said, God, take me at ease. As nothing happened, I remember panicking, but this time, they had brought the cart out now. They put, the, they put a board under me to lift me up to the one, two, three lift. And as they lifted me up, I was praying for a gasp of air or anything. I caught a gasp of air, so it felt like, had anybody ever knocked the wind out of themselves? Because that's exactly what it felt like when you're <laughs> gasping for air. That's exactly what I felt. So I said, man, I caught a gasp. I'm like, you know what? I just knocked the wind out of myself. I have a full body stinger. I'll be right. Let me try to give that thumbs up to the crowd. Let everyone know it's going to be okay. I went to give the thumbs up to the crowd, and I felt like just the, the weight of the world was on my hand. Couldn't move it at all. Get an ambulance and my mom, I remember, is in you know, on the field with my sister, you know, hysterical. I'm trying to tell her, you know, everything's gonna be okay. I just I have a full body stinger and you know, just everything was gonna come back. 
to put an oxygen mask on me, and I was ignorant to the fact of what an oxygen mask actually does for you. I'm thinking once they put this on, I'll be able to take that inhale and exhale. I went to inhale, and nothing happened, and I blacked out. I don't remember much after that, but bits and pieces. But the pieces I do remember getting to the hospital and being going down the room, looking up and seeing a bunch of lights. Then I remember being in a room with a bunch of doctors, sounding like they're speaking a different language. Then I remember being in that room by myself with a bunch of monitors and sounds going off. And people always ask me, how did you deal with those first few days, that first week of your injury? And I always say, I really don't remember much. I was so highly medicated from the surgery that I actually feel for my family, my teammates, my, my closest friends that were there, because those are the ones that had to go through it. They were fully aware and cognitive of what was going on. And the doctor had put my mom in the room and said, your son has fractured a C3, C4 vertebrae. He'll be paralyzed for the rest of his life. He'll never walk again, never breathe on his own, never eat solid foods, and never pretty much never live a normal life or hoping that he's strong enough to make it through the surgery. So imagine being my mom after hearing that, you know, she was devastated. But they let me see her before I went into surgery. And I kind of remember this, kind of don't, it's very blurry, but the adrenaline must have still been flowing from the game. And I remember I said to her, I'll be back. And when she heard me say that, she said, you know what? If he's fighting now, we got to still be there for him. We got to keep on pushing. Don't let him see you down. Don't let him see you negative. Don't let him see you anything, any type of upset. And that's exactly what happened. When I finally started to come to on Wednesday and started to remember things and realize what was going on, I woke up to a room filled with just posters and jerseys and cards and footballs, all these you know, people wishing me well, sending me stuff from, from the entire world. It was amazing to see. The amount of support was overwhelming. I had no idea the type of impact I, I made on the world that, that was happening, but everyone that started to come into my room had this positive attitude. They're like, E, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. We're going to get you up. We're going to get you working. We got you. We got your back, this and that. And that's exactly what I needed to hear. You never know how much positive reinforcement and prayer could do for you. When you're in your darkest moments, when you're laying there on my deathbed, and I thought those moments helped me get through it. But there were tough times. I went through the terrors of the night, I called them. Finally, after four or five days, my mom not sleeping. She had to go get some sleep, get some rest, you know, so she didn't get sick herself. And my workers got her a nice hotel room right next to the, you know, to the hospital. But I was alone at night most of the time because Coach Shannon would come and stay with me from about 11 p.m. until 2 a.m. in the morning. And I would act like I was sleeping, but I was still, you know, I'm, I can't move now. My whole life is flipping, turned upside down. Tubes coming out of me every which way. You know, a lot of, you know, dark thoughts go through your head. He would stay until about 2 a.m. in the morning, and then finally he would leave to go get some rest because he had to be back at work at 6. And I remember laying there in that, in that, in that uh, hospital bed, like, like, this is my life right now. Like, I'm, I'm terrified. I don't know these people that are around me, these nurses and the doctors. And I had all I can get with their attention was by using my head to hit a little call bell. So if I needed them and they didn't, and I knocked the call bell over, I wouldn't even be able to call anybody because I couldn't even yell at the time. So some scary times, but finally I had a conversation with the nurse that came into my room and I asked her, why do you do this job? Like, what made you want to be an ICU nurse? And she said, I see people that come in here at the most down moments, their darkest times of their life. And it's my job to try to leave them with some sort, of, some sort of hope when they get out of this ICU and go about their life. I don't do this job for the paycheck, I do it for the patients. When I heard that, I was like, you know what? That stuck with me because I said, now it gave me the trust that I'm in good hands. This woman's not just here for the paycheck. She's trying to help her patients out, do whatever they need. And she even came and sat in my office. I mean, I sat in my uh, the room with me because I didn't, didn't know what was going on. She was just sitting there, talking to me, having a conversation, and built a friendship. Allowed me to trust somebody that I had no idea who they were until they started taking care of me. Finally, about after three weeks at, in the hospital, it was time for me to move to Kessler, which I thought I was going home after the hospital, but they're like, no, you got a long road ahead of you, inpatient rehab in West Orange. So I woke up on November 3rd and I was like, you know what? Still don't feel right. Something's like off. I'm falling asleep. Some people, I'm exhausted. But everyone was pumping me up like, e, we got to get you out of here. We're going to get you back on your feet walking again, get to therapy, you know, start working out again. So I said, okay, let's go. We, we did the transfer from, say, uh, we, I was at Hackensack Hospital too. 
my star is a Kessler. And once I got there, I remember getting carted down the hallway, hear all these voices saying, that's the Rutgers football player. Like whispering, I can hear him on. No, no one knew my name. It's, oh, it was just always a Rutgers football player. So I get in my room and Kessler decided that they wanted to introduce me to everybody that day. The CEO of the building, the administration staff, the nursing staff, the physical therapist, occupational therapist. You know, a lot of guys, the last person that comes in is this five foot six Jamaican dude and he looks at me and goes, I'm gonna be taking care of you, mom. I'm gonna get you up, I'm gonna get you dressed, washed up, this and that. And I'm like, there's no way this little man is gonna be able to take care of me. So I look at my mom and I'm like, mom, you gotta get me out of here. And she yells at me for you know talking in front of this man like that. But I was, I'm not gonna lie, I was terrified and I did judge a book by his cover. Little did I know that Humphrey, which was the name was gonna be, teaching my mom all these different methods of how to take care of a quadriplegic, how to move me around, do this and that, and we ended up hitting it off. But at the time, I was absolutely terrified. I ended up leaving the room, and I remember trying to just get it settled in my room, and Rutgers was playing that night. They were playing down in South Florida, so I was amped up because I got to pick out the uniforms and my teammates, you know, throwing up the 5-2 sign and the cameras on ESPN. It was, it was awesome, so I was excited. So the game was going back and forth, back and forth, but then the fourth quarter came. I remember I'm laying in my bed. It's getting late. I start getting real hot, real anxious, and real jittery. I'm asking the aide that was working. I'm like, can you move my shoulders this way? Bring them back over here. Put a pillow under my arm. Put it under my legs. Hang on me this way. And everyone's like, E, just calm down. I'm like, I can't get comfortable. I'm hot. I'm burning up. I remember we went to lose on the last two plays of the game. And I'm like, you know what? It was just a long day. Let me go to sleep, get some rest. And, you know, tomorrow was another day. Well, I went to sleep and I woke up about an hour and a half later and I go to open my eyes and my vision was completely blurred. And I feel somebody smacking me in my face saying, Eric, wake up, wake up. And it didn't sound like a male or female. It didn't even sound, he would sound like a, like a demon, like, Eric, wake up. And I said, hit me again. And it was my mom. She smacked me right across my face again. And I remember I tried to go after her. Not knowing what was going on. Obviously, I couldn't move, but she said I let out like this growl to go after her. She ran out the room and got the nurses and said, he doesn't even recognize who I am. We have to get him out of here now. Coming to find out at 105.5 degree fever, I was 0.5 degrees away from frying my brain and becoming brain dead for the rest of my life if they couldn't figure out what was causing this fever and get it to come down because my body temperature was just way too hot. So now it's November and I got ice packs all on the side of me, getting rushed out to the hospital again. And my mom has to call down to my coach and let him know what's going on. And I remember he told me, Months and months later that he was afraid to turn on his cell phone when he learned it, landed back in New Jersey that night because he didn't know what type of news I was gonna, that he was going to land to if I had pulled through the night. But to the grace of God, I was still there. And him and my athletic director came right over to the hospital about 3.30 in the morning. As I'm laying in that, the hospital room, I remember waking up completely delirious. I see my sister and my athletic director. And I asked my sister, are we going to IHOP today? And she goes, no, nah, Eric, we're not going to IHOP. You need to relax. I'm like, well, why not? I want some pancakes. Let's go to IHOP. And she goes, no, nah, Eric, you can't eat. Some, like, you, you really can't go to IHOP. So I tried to get up and walk it off and try to go for a walk to blow it off steam. So I'm like, Nicole, get off of me. And I want to go for a walk. She goes, Eric, I'm not on you. I'm like, Nicole, get off. I want to go for a walk. She goes, Eric, you can't get up and go for a walk. I remember getting so frustrated. I threw my head back on the pillow and blacked out. Say another hour went by, hour and a half, it's about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I wake up now, I'm finally starting to feel better today. I, had, I finally had some antibiotics in me and the fluids going through, so I started to actually feel better. So I'm looking around, my co coach is knocked out with a spilled cup of coffee on the ground. My sister is over and my mom were leaning on each other on another chair, completely knocked out. So ESPN was on the TV, so I was just watching TV, just checking out my surroundings. But the story I'm about to tell you changed my life forever. Because I'm laying there now, starting to get loud in the hallway. And all of a sudden, you see a girl get rushed by on a stretcher. And then you see mom and dad and the grandparents go by. Then a bunch of kids, a little bit older than you guys, right about 15, 16 years old. After that, you can overhear the nurses talking after I finally settled down in the hallway. And you can hear them say that the girl got rushed in because she had a cancerous tumor on her brain. And it started to bleed out. So they had to do emergency surgery on her. So like, wow, I'm like, you know, that sounds terrible. Another 45 minutes go by or so. It's getting, you know, about to be the morning, but everyone's still sleeping. It starts to get louder in the hallway again. So I see all these people going through now. 
hysterical. Mom, daddy, grandparents, then the kids, 15, 16 years old, hysterical. Finally, everyone funneled through, and I'm like, you know, that didn't sound good. And I can overhear the nurse just talking outside again. And unfortunately, that girl didn't make it through the night. She passed, she passed away on the operating table. And I said to myself right then and there, whatever I need to do, if I need to pray, if I need to relax, if I need to start working hard, I'm going to do because I don't want to have my family, my friends that are over there, my teammates, have to leave the hospital like that because it was just a horrible moment. And I know probably that girl would do anything to be able to have another chance. And yes, I'm not able to breathe on my own at the time, but I'm still breathing. So it kind of motivated me at the same time. Five days later, I was back at Kessler. And when I got to Kessler down for the second time, my story had been in the newspapers and on TV and this and that. So they kind of treated me like a celebrity. I never really had that celebrity treating. So I would go to the gym and I would get pushed into the gym and everyone would be working out, going through their routine. As soon as I got in there, all of a sudden, everyone stopped what they were doing and they turned their head to the doorway. Like I was about to come in there doing backflips or something. They pushed me all the way around to the back of the room and everyone would just stare at me as I went through. No one would say nothing. Just stare at me until I get to the back of my therapist and then that was it. So I just said, whatever. Put my hood up and I went to work. Just started working out, doing whatever I can do at the time. Finally, after two weeks, someone had the courage to finally come up to me and talk to me and say something. And he introduced himself, and his name was Jermaine. Jermaine was 22 at the time. I was 20, so we hit it off right away. I, I'm not going to lie. You ruckers, they took care of me. They had my flat screen TV brought up to my room, had the Xbox connected to it, and even put a satellite dish on top of my room, so I had all the TV channels. So well, this after therapy was over, my room was the hangout room, and Jermaine had his upper body so he could wheel himself down. So he would be coming and playing the Xbox, and I'd be talking junk to him. So how terrible he was at Call of Duty and, and, and Madden and this and that, because he was horrible. I'm like, you're lucky my hands aren't working right now because I'll be tearing them up. But we hit it off right away, you know, that was, that was my guy. As time started to go along, I'm like, Jermaine's starting to meet all my friends and my teammates and whatnot, but I don't really know much about Jermaine. So I came to that crossroads of that uncomfortable situation. I'm like, how do you ask somebody how they got in a wheelchair? I don't want to be disrespectful. You know, I don't want to feel, you know, like I don't know much. I'm like, how do I do it? So I always constantly remember the coach, he used to always scream to us while we were going to practice in 120 degree weather. And they'll go in one ear, right out the other. But he always used to say, you got to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I was in an uncomfortable situation. I said, you know what? I'm just going to be genuine. I'm going to ask him literally how it happened or was he born like that and see how it goes. And I said to Jermaine, I'm like, hey, Jermaine, how did you get in the wheelchair? Were you born that way or did you have an accident? You know, I'm just curious to know because you know everything about me, but I really don't know much about your accident. And that's honestly the best way to do it. When you guys come across uncomfortable situations, being genuine, being polite about it, and being actually willing to understand, that's the best way to go about it. People look at me all the time differently. They see me, they turn their heads, they don't know what to do. Coming up to somebody and asking somebody a simple question of, do you need help or how did you get in a wheelchair? Is there any way I can help you or do anything for you? Is the best way to do it. You're gonna see people in your life that look different than you, act differently than you, or may go about things in certain ways different than you. Not only someone in a wheelchair, but always be respectful, be polite, and be genuine and watch where it takes you. You never know where a conversation may lead. But back to where I was saying, now when I asked Jermaine, he proceeded to go on and tell me the craziest story I've ever heard in my life, but he said one day he was walking and started to get real fatigued in his legs. Next week went by, he said he started to lose control of his bowels and bladder and going to the bathroom on himself. So he went to the doctor and the doctor prescribed him medicine for his bowels and bladder, but told him that he needs to either lose weight or start working out more because his legs aren't strong enough to support his body weight. And right there, he should have known that was a red flag because he was definitely overweight. He was about 5'8", 200 plus pounds, but he could support your body weight at that size. He said about a month went by, he was actually working at Newark Airport. And he sat down to eat lunch one day. And when he got up to throw away his meal, he wasn't able to get up no more. They had to call an ambulance in there and they brought him to the hospital. Then they finally took him in and they did a CAT scan and an MRI on him, come to find out that he had a cancerous tumor growing on the lower part of his spinal cord, which was causing all the signals from his brain down to his lower extremities to be paralyzed. And that's why he was not able to move 
or have any function below there. They told them that the tumor now was, was at a size where if they operate on it to take it out, they would have to completely sever his spinal cord, which is cut through his spinal cord and he'll be paralyzed and a waist down for the rest of his life. So they went and they did the regular chemo and the radiation to try to shrink this tumor out and see if he can gain back any function down to his lower extremities. But some you could tell that it was beating him up because some days he was with it and other days he was completely out of it. Finally, five months was now that we were at Kessler. It was, I think, around March 28th. It was time for me to go home. I was moving to my aunt's house at the time in Jackson, New Jersey, until my house was rebuilt up here. So I got, I went home, and I didn't really say goodbye to Jermaine because he was in the hospital at the time, going through one of his treatments. So I took a two-week break, got adjusted to my new home life, what that was going to be like with nursing, coming to your house, and all this stuff. So I was getting my routine down. So after two weeks, I went back up to Kessler to outpatient therapy, different part of the gym, different therapists. Everything was just amped up to another level. So I rolled into the gym that day, you know, ready to go. But the first person I saw when I rolled over there was Jermaine. He was in a wheelchair clinic and fitted for one of his chairs that was going to be his permanent chair. So I rolled over to Jermaine first. I was like, Jermaine, what's going on, man? Like, how you doing? And he looks at me and goes, who are you? And I'm like... Bro, like we just spent the past five months together. Like, you don't recognize me, but you could tell. Like one eye was looking this way, the other was looking that way. So things had taken a turn for the worse. It looked like the cancer had spread. So I went over and did my evaluation for the day. And he left a little bit earlier than me and went upstairs. So I said, you know what? It was a Friday. So I said, I'll check back with him on Monday. Maybe he'll be in a better place. So I come back on Monday. The first thing I did was roll to the wheelchair clinic. I'm like, hey. How'd you guys in the gym? Did Jermaine get fitted for his permanent chair? They're like, yeah, we fit him and everything, but unfortunately, Jermaine passed away over the weekend. I said, you know what? He'll never hear me complain about anything. That kid wouldn't do anything to be able to take care of himself, have a support system like I had. Meanwhile, I got millions of people reaching out to me, you know, thousands of people come to visit me. The support was just overwhelming in the most positive way there is, but there's other people that don't have that. Yeah, I saw his, I met his mom twice and his dad one time in five months there. Wore the same clothes five days in a row. I was giving him clothes to wear. My grandma was cooking home cooked meals for him over the weekend. You know, things like that. It makes you put a lot of things in perspective. And you gotta learn to be appreciative for the things that you do have. Don't focus on the things that you don't have. And if it's something that you really want, you work your butt off to get it. Everyone comes from different backgrounds, different, different environments. But that doesn't mean that someone is better than someone else. Yes, I have millions of people supporting me. Jermaine had nobody there supporting him. Doesn't make him any different or any less worthy of being able to fight for paralysis and be able to hopefully one day walk again. It inspired me and it gave me hope. It made me start a foundation, Team LeGrand, with the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, which has now raised over $2 million for spinal cord injury research. For people like Jermaine, many of other people that I have met in similar situations that don't have the same platform that I have. I wish that they could be sitting here in front of you, speaking. I have a friend, Ingrid, who got into a car accident and her head went through the windshield and she should have stayed there, but she pulled it out, got to get out of her car one day. She turned, I mean, that, right after the accident, turned her head the wrong way. Her neck wasn't stable and unfortunately now she's paralyzed. She lives in the inner city of Jersey City in an apartment built in two bedrooms with about six people living in there. And the apartment, she says, the elevator breaks down every year for about three months out of the year. She can't get out the apartment. You look at stuff like that and you say, you know what? Yeah, I may not have everything, but life ain't bad. Life is good. And you work for the things that you really want. And you learn about growing through the process, handling adversity, overcoming obstacles, and defeating the odds. And when you get to the light at the end of the tunnel, it feels that much better. When I got injured, I only had 60 credits completed at Rutgers. It takes 120 credits to graduate. A lot of people think that they automatically gave me my degree. I was like, nah, I don't work like that. I wish they did. But um, I actually had to start taking classes via Skype. And I was in my room taking classes via Skype when someone would email me over the notes after a three hour lecture hall. And I had to use this software called Dragon Natural Speaking. We had to talk to the computer to navigate it around. And let's just say, it's not easy to type out a paper and move a mouse around, but it was something I had to do. And people say, like, what is your biggest accomplishment to this day? I'm um, like graduating with my degree in labor relations in 2014 because it was not an easy road. 
can't even lift up my hand and write my name on a piece of paper, but we found a way to get it done. Being with my academic advisors, tutors, rushing to class after therapy. You know, my mom put a lot of whole effort into that. And I'm proud to have that diploma hanging on the wall for Mama Dukes, just like my sister was able to do. And I still say to this day, that was my biggest accomplishment. It wasn't always easy, it wasn't always fun, but it was something I really wanted to do. And I wasn't gonna stop until I, until I got there. I always say, I live by a definition, guys, and Kasim knows it too, if I can repeat it back to you. And it's a definition of success because it was embedded in our head at Rutgers, but I truly believe in it. And it's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be. I'll say it one more time. It's the peace of mind you get knowing you did everything you could to be the best you can be, no matter what it is. If it's on working on a math project or a school project, or if that's on a football field, a baseball field, basketball court, helping your mom or your parents on the weekend. You give it your best, watch, watch the things that happen to you. When you look yourself in the mirror and you say, you know what, I gave my all today. There was nothing left I could give. Put your head on that pillow and sleep at ease. And if you didn't, we're all human. God willing, you wake up the next morning, you look yourself in the mirror again and say, today, I'm going to make today my best day. Watch where your life takes you. Watch the opportunities that come your way. Watch the people that come in your life. It'll truly be something special, believe me. I know it. And do I have every, my best day every day? No. But I go out there and try to be as consistent as possible with it and everything that I do. And I know one day that I'm going to go back to MetLife Stadium and lay back down on that 25-yard line. I'm going to finish that last play. And it's going to be a special day here in New Jersey. So I thank you for the time for letting me share my story with you today. I truly do appreciate everything you guys do for me and this community in Avenel because you guys are my home, and that's why I still live here. So thank you. Thank you.